afternoon and welcome to the Ontario Invasive Plant Council's 2017-2018 Winter Webinar Series. My name is Colin Casson and I am the coordinator of the OIPC and I'll be hosting today's webinar from Peterborough, Ontario. If this is your first time joining the Ontario Invasive Plant Council for a webinar, welcome and thanks for joining us. Your return customer, welcome back. A few quick housekeeping notes before we begin today's webinar. Attendees have been placed on mute to start today's webinar. I encourage you to introduce yourself and your organization using the chat feature bar on the right side of your screen. Tim and our presentation will begin shortly and will last for approximately 45 minutes. Please will then have the opportunity to ask questions by writing them into the WebEx's chat feature on the right side. With that said, let's move on to today's feature. Today's presentation will be delivered by Donna McKenzie of Ontario Beatles. For more than two decades, Donna and her company, Ontario Beetles, have been at the forefront of purple strife biological control efforts happening across Ontario. She's worked with municipalities, conservation authorities, and many other land managers and stakeholder groups to offer purple loosestrife biological control services. She's been a great supporter of OIPC and has been a key resource in reviewing our best management practices and technical bulletin documents on purple loosestrife, which you can find on our website for free at www.ontarioinvasiveplants.ca/bmp, or linked on the Ontario Beetles website at www.ontariobeetles.ca. Now, with that out of the way, we're ready for today's webinar. Donna, thank you again for joining us today, and without further ado, over to you. Hi, Colin. Hello, everyone. Thanks for the introduction. Um, so, as Colin said, I'm going to be talking today about Ontario's Biological Control Program for Purple Loosestrife, and more uh, specifically, my experiences with this program over the past 25 years. First slide. Good. Um, so, the plant we are speaking of today is Lithrum salicaria. Um, it's uh, in the family Lithraceae, and Wikipedia tells me that there are 38 species of Lithrum that occur globally. As far as I'm aware, there is only one native species of Lithrum that occurs in Ontario, and it's Lithrum alatum, or winged loose stripe. But Lithrum salicaria is clearly of Asian origin. It's not from this part of the world. And it has quite a long history of arrival here in North America. It's uh, believed that it's been introduced uh, many times over the years, probably both intentionally and unintentionally. And there's reports in uh, the literature and in various writings of it being here back into the 1800s. Um, from a human perspective, it does have a usefulness um, it has been used as a beautiful plant in the garden in the past, uh, but don't plant it in your garden. Um, it is an important, it can be an important foraging plant for bees. Um, apparently the above ground plant material produces a beautiful brown dye, and it does have a history of um, medicinal usage, uh, particularly in Europe and it's a, the above ground plant material again, apparently used for internal disorders. And when I was doing my research for this webinar, I found a journal paper uh, that had been published last year coming out of France, and it was in a, a scientific journal called Cos Cosmetics. And apparently, um, the above ground plant material is being uh, investigated as a source of activity ingredients uh, in the cosmetic field. So uh, possibly um, it can be good for the skin. But um, it also has a shadow side, of course, and that is um, its invasive quality. So um, I feel that it was probably the 1950s, 60s, 70s, when um, Eastern North America, in particular, purple loosestrife started coming onto the radar um, for its invasive qualities, and uh, people started writing about it, reporting about it, um, and uh, concern levels were rising. And this was um, in the United, Eastern United States and also creeping into Canada. 
and it's because of um, the plant invasive qualities. Um, so I've listed a number here. Um, the plant can aggressively colonize disturbed habitats, of which we have plenty of in parts of eastern North America, southern Ontario, and other parts of Ontario. Um, it's a seed producer. So there are certain papers that have reported uh, that a single plant can produce more than a million seeds in a growing season. Uh, this can remain dormant in the seed bank for many years. Uh, individual plants can form really large root masses just full of carbohydrate reserves. And then these individual root masses can form really dense stands, particularly in low-lying areas or in wetland habitats. And then um, it is also seen to uh, outcompete native species in wetland habitats, and therefore impact community structure and biodiversity. Looking through a bit of a chime lag. So bear with me. I'll try. Um, uh, this brings us to biological control. Um, so in this uh, program really got initiated uh, in, in the 1980s and it was in response to uh, these observations of uh, the invasive quality of the plant. So the uh, initial work was done, uh, it started with the International Institute for Biological Control, IIBC, and Cornell University, Bernd Blossie in the United States. And then, of course, Ag Canada and, and University of Guelph uh, came on board shortly after. Um, I've uh, included a, a little um, definition for classical biological control, which is a particular type of biological control. Um, classical biological control is the use of host specific specialists, so in this case, insects, to suppress or control populations. So, case the populations of an invasive plant species. Um, I mentioned that um, Roger from Canada and uh, gave a really great uh, webinar several weeks back on implementing biocontrol for invasive plants in Ontario. If you're interested in biological control, um, I would recommend that you go back to the OPEC uh, website and track down uh, Rob's talk and give it a listen. I'm not going to get into biocontrol in too much detail today because Rob did such an excellent job of it several weeks back. Um, I do want to, uh, however, um, just highlight um, uh, this word specialists, um, and highlight uh, specialist insects, um, because this is a really important element in the biological control program. Uh, we know that insects can be specialists. Uh, we know about the monarch butterfly, the larvae requiring um, milkweed uh, to complete its life cycle. We know about, so that's on the left hand side in the photos at the bottom. And we know about things like um, berry emperor, which is a butterfly whose larvae are only, are completely dependent on the hackberry tree to complete their survival. So um, um, we're specialists in identifying um, insects, that specialist is a critical part of the biological control process. Just, there we go. Uh, this is information that I uh, took from Rob's talk, and I thought I'd just highlight it here um, so you can see um, what the stages of a weed biocontrol program are here in Canada. Uh, there's seven steps uh, that Rob identified. Um, I've put dark black line through the middle to kind of break uh, the stages up into two sections. The first four stages, the first four steps, are before agents are approved for re release. And through seven are the stages uh, that come after the agents are, are approved for release. So I'm going to be uh, focusing on my talk on stages five, six, and seven. And these are the stages um, that I've been involved in with this particular biological control program. Uh, oh, 
as it stands right now, there are four biocontrol agents uh, that currently uh, can be found in Ontario um, for blue stripe biocontrol. So I'm going to go through them. There's two species of beetle, Neogallerichella calmariensis and Neogallerichella fusilla. And these uh, beetles are formerly of the uh, genus Gallerichella. So you may be familiar with them under that, uh, from that name. Uh, they were reassigned a few years ago. And these two species were approved for release in North America, so both Canada and the U.S., in 1992. They're living beetles, so they're of the family Chrysomelidae, and they're the dominant release agents throughout North America. There's two species. Uh, it's Hylobius transverso vitatis. <laughs> Excuse me, it's a root feeding weevil. It was also approved for release in Canada and the U.S. in 1992, and there have been a few releases of it that were done back in the early 90s in the vicinity of University of Guelph, but the status of Hylobius is not currently known. Uh, it's a fourth species. It's a flower feeding weevil, and it's Nepes memoritus memoritus. It was approved for release in Canada in 1997, and uh, it is also here in Ontario. <laughs> Even though it has never, to my understanding, Understanding and my knowledge, it has never been officially released here in Ontario. It has, but it was released in Manitoba, and it has been released in New York State, and um, it has found its way through natural dispersal into Ontario. And I'll talk a little bit more about that particular agent uh, lately, uh, later. But um, for certain, the domin dominant uh, release agents are the Neogallerichella. Uh, two adults uh, sitting on a purple loosestrife leaf, laying down a beautiful little egg mass. Um, this is probably Calaricella calmariensis. Uh, calmariensis and Pusilla look very similar. Um, and at the top of the page, I've uh, read that these are host-specific herbivores. They spend their entire life cycle either on the plant or at the base of the plant. So here is a purple loosestrife leaf, and it shows a couple of egg masses, and uh, it also shows a little bit of shot hole feeding. So this is the type of feeding damage. This is the type of feeding that the adult uh, Neogallerichella, I'm going to be saying Gallerichella and Neogallerichella intermittently throughout this whole time. I know it. Um, that's the characteristic feeding damage uh, for these two species. If you're out in the field and you're curious, you can look around in June and July and look for uh, egg masses and feeding damage. I'm going to flip through. <laughs> Sticky control. There we go. Uh, these are the larvae. Larvae. Uh, they're quite obvious because of this beautiful yellow color. They get more yellow as they work through their instar stages. And uh, they, you can see they feed from the bottom side of the leaf. They do a type of feeding called windowing. And actually graze off all layers of the underside of the leaf, except for the upper epidermal layer of the leaf. And they leave that, that behind. Uh, so um, if you're curious, you can look for that type of feeding and that life stage in the field as well. I'm through uh, Neogallerichella behavior a little bit. So I'll talk about the life cycle. In the uh, left-hand corner of, of this photo, you'll see the adults. They overwinter in the soil at the base of the plant. Um, if the plants are growing in standing water, they can actually bore into the stem of the plant and overwinter in the stem of the plant. They spring uh, from the soil when the plants become active in about mid-May. And as soon as they emerge from the so soil, they start feeding on the plants and they start laying egg masses. They do that over a couple of week period. And then in the lower uh, right hand corner of the photo, you see the larvae. So around the 1st of June, uh, larvae start hatching. And they tend to dig into the meristematic tissue. They love the tender lung tissue of the plants. They start feeding there. 
they uh, are voracious eaters. And um, they move several instar stages. They work their way down the plant toward the soil until they move right into the soil or bore into the stem of the plant to pupate. So those are the pupae on the left in the left hand corner. Uh, and then uh, uh, occurs in the soil. And then um, in early July, right, these are a generalization for timing. Uh, the adults uh, emerge from the soil, and that's one complete generation. There can be more than one generation per year. That's important. And uh, what else is important is that both the adult and the larvae feed on the plant, and this, and therefore the species is really quite impactful because of uh, two life stages both feeding on the plant. Uh, a few years ago, it was identified that both and calmariensis emit an aggregate pheromone, so they release a chemical. Uh, it's an attracting chemical, so they attract each other. If you're out in the field looking, um, uh, them unmasked on a single plant and also within a stand of loose strike, and it's because of this aggregating pheromone. Um, they also disperse, the adults fly, and they have the ability to move through space-time, and I'll talk a little bit uh, more about that in this next slide. Um, so I'm going to focus on the first 10 years of this project. Uh, uh, the early work was done through the University of Guelph, and I was involved in that. We started releasing insects in 92, so it was like we went through 90, we were releasing insects in 93, 94, 95, and it became clear uh, very quickly um, these agents had phenomenal potential. Um, shot. This was, was taken on the Speed River in 1997. We, were, we called these trashed plants. We still do. We fashed plants. Um, and we found lots of trashed plants. <laughs> and this was super encouraging because we found them not only in places where the insects released, where had been released, but we found them uh, at, uh, in places uh, disjunct from where the insects had been released. So there, there were these two elements, heavy plant damage, and uh, we were noticing uh, that insects had this capability of dispersal. They were moving. Um, this is a shot from what uh, sort of became one of our flagship release sites. Uh, I'll just through it. We released insects here in 1993, both Calmariensis and Pusilla. Very low numbers, actually. I think 50 mated pairs of Pusilla, 50 mated pairs of Calmariensis. Back in 1994, July of 1994, the beetles were established. They said the winter, and that's really important. Um, really seeing much, if anything, in terms of impact. There was still extensive flowering. And, uh, when we went back in July, of 1995, uh, it, it, it was shocking to see how the population of biocontrol agents had exploded at this one particular site. Um, so high populations of insects, large-scale defoliation. You can see all the dead stalks in that second photo from the previous year's growth. Uh, the plants were still there, clearly. They were alive. Um, but uh, um, there was very little flowering, and because there was little flowering, there was no seed production at this site. Um, the top in the top photo in this shot, um, I've called the plant community response. And this was in 97. I have a little tag up on my screen, so I can't see that. But um, what we were seeing at this point, and this is consistent with what we're seeing at other sites, is once. Um, uh, beetles had fed on the plants for a few growing seasons. Uh, the strife was starting to lose its competitive edge within the community structure, and the plant community was responding. And in particular, at this site, we were seeing lots of native cattail moving in. And then the lower shot is, is, was taken in 2004. And um, at this point, uh, I would consider this site to have been stable and would have called that localized control. The purple loosestrife was still there. It had not been eradicated, and that 
that's important. It's still part of the community structure, but um, it, that com that aggressive, uh, invasive quality um, that it was different. Things were different now. now. Um, earlier in this project, um, I'll credit Jim Corrigan for recognizing a, a very, we, we were seeing something in the field that was very, very important and it proved to be very important in the long run. It was that the insects were following uh, water courses for their dispersal and they were targeting plants that were growing on the water's edge. So on the edge of creeks, on the edge of flowing, any kind of flowing water, uh, on the on the edges of lakes, they really honed into the margins, and those were the plants that they were focusing on. So uh, we started to think, well, why don't we uh, introduce uh, and develop a management plan that's based on a watershed basis? We we try to target a watershed um, in terms of control. So we did that we chose the Grand River watershed and we got good support from the Conservation Authority and from Environment Canada and we did a two-year study there. Um, first year with assessment. This was the days before internet, so people filled out survey forms. They sent them back to us by mail. We got a sense of how the strike was distributed through the watershed. We did a lot of footwork. Uh, we developed maps. We got an understanding of where the loose strike was. And then in 1997, we started working with volunteers, municipal agencies, conservation groups, and we did releases. We did 40 releases uh, throughout the Grand River watershed. That was a fun thing to do. Um, one of the things that we did as part of that project was uh, we developed a monitoring protocol. And, um, and we taught people how to monitor the release sites. Um, uh, we made it very, very simple. We at this we saw that there was so much potential. We really decided to focus on number of releases. So we do as many releases as we could, and we try to make the monitoring simple so that anyone could do it. Um, so this was the process. Um, the monitoring was all based on randomly selected one meter squared plots. And monitoring was done at three different times during the season. Uh, in the early season, egg mass counts were done in the plots. And in the fall, um, we taught people how to collect uh, plant data from these one meter squared plots. And uh, we also um, developed a protocol for taking uh, and keeping photographic records uh, from the release sites. And so the monitoring protocol that we developed, we were using that uh, right from the early, early days of the project, and we were still using that monitoring protocol, that same monitoring protocol. So that's been consistent over a 20-year period, which I think is pretty, pretty cool. Here, is, uh, here are some photos from Mercer's Glen, uh, which is located in the Royal Botanical Gardens in Hamilton. Uh, we did release here in 1992, again, Calmariensis and Pusilla, and these are photographic records um, from uh, Mercer's Glen. Ta they were taken during July of uh, the respective uh, years, and you can see just visually by looking at the three different shots how um, uh, this plant community has changed over time. Um, just one uh, t way of um, uh, we'll be looking at changes in a plant community over time. And also have data. This is just an example of some of the data that uh, we have for sites across Ontario. This data is from Mercer's Glen. Uh, you can see we have data from 94, 95, 96, 97, 98. There's a, I've got some data from 2013. And uh, we can look at a uh, mean number of egg masses. Uh, so also some information about uh, the plants from these randomly selected one meter squared plots. Um, when I look over that first 10 years, and really the whole project, I think it's interesting to uh, reflect on 
this is considered to be highly successful in Ontario. And I think it's interesting to look at why. What, what, what about this project that has made it so successful? So I've uh, listed a few of these things that I think have been important from my perspective. Uh, the first element is partnership. Um, I've, with so many people over the years, so many UCs and so many individuals, um, education and um, awareness, uh, agencies that help with releases, agencies that have helped with monitoring, all levels of government, landowners, volunteers, conservation groups. And if it weren't for those partnerships, um, we wouldn't have been able to accomplish the work that we did. Um, second element of success, from my perspective, has been the number of releases that we've done over the years. Um, I get Jim Corrigan, that approach, um, when we saw how, how much potential at the beginning there was for these uh, agents um, the, to really try and get them out into the entire province of Ontario. So we worked on our release methodologies. Um, uh, we started redistributing larvae. We were moving them around. Uh, we were collecting them from field and moving to different sites. We up the number of uh, insects that we released at one time. And this still holds true today. There's a minimum of 5,000 insects for each release. Uh, really, we stuck with the watershed focus. And we started targeting watersheds in south, central, east, and northern Ontario. And we worked with a lot of volunteers and a lot of different agencies. Um, and that's important in this, uh, uh, in this approach. And the last point, um, uh, that element I feel that's been uh, really valuable is just the level of commitment um, seen um, from these agencies over the years. It's very easy to follow the rise and fall of trends, um, public awarenesses and wanes, and um, the commitment that this consistent commitment over a 25 year period has really helped me uh, and others develop a familiarity with the movements and behaviors of the beetles in southern Ontario. And this has really helped, um, helped me um, uh, work with people and management over the years. Um, noteworthy to mention that um, at the 10-year point, um, Oregon, uh, one of the early researchers from this project, he was um, procured by Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources at the time to go and visit all, all the releases to date and a tour around Ontario and get an, a sense of what was happening in the field. So he did that. He visited South, Central, and Eastern Ontario, and he was at uh, release sites. And he uh, looked on to the release sites, and he started looking at watersheds to get an impression of what was happening in the field. It was a very uh, large-scale approach. And Jim found... Um, Kind of, we had already knew and suspected there was widespread dispersal of the insects. It was maybe a bit of a stretch to say that the insects were everywhere, but the dispersal and um, and range of these insects now is phenomenal across the province. And found that the beetles were impacting the plants. He um, noted that there really was a tendency for water's edge control. Um, noted that it. It, that some sites might be resistant. Um, he didn't know why at the time, and um, but he did note that. And um, he noticed that dominant uh, agent in the field had become Calmarensis. He really didn't find very many Pusilla anymore in the field. Um, and uh, in North Ontario was a little bit interesting. It's like maybe. Um, were a bit slower developing up there than they were in the south. Perhaps it's all speculation, but perhaps fewer generations per year. Um, 
something happening could have had something to do with habitat, but he did notice that in the north. Um, this takes me to um, to Ontario beetles. I'm uh, just going to talk a little bit about how I, I do releases, how we do releases. I've called this slide releases, who, what, when, where, why. And um, I just thought I'd go through this uh, so you know uh, what's being done. I don't think there's been a year um, since 1992 when I haven't released beetles. Um, it's been a consistent thing for me in life for the last 25 years. Uh, who's releasing uh, beetles? Well, everyone, the same groups that have always been re releasing beetles, <laughs> landers, uh, conservation groups, um, levels of government. And uh, what's happening now is that people call me up, they track me down, and uh, we work together to come up with a strategy and a release strategy um, for the sites that they're interested in, uh, in managing. Um, what are we releasing? We're re releasing uh, a minimum of 5,000 larvae uh, at each release site. And these uh, larvae that we're releasing are field collected. Uh, when are we doing it? We're doing it in the summer months, uh, preferably June, sometimes into July as well, for sure. Uh, where are we doing it? This is a big part of the process. We carefully select uh, a place and location where I feel um, uh, we'll have the most success getting the beetles established at the site where they're being released. Why are we doing this is, from my perspective, really want to uh, keep the province populated with these viral agents. Um, the shot of me arriving with a box of beetles, and in that, um, this is myself and Kevin DeMill from Crow Valley Conservation, and we're doing a release at Island Lake Conservation area in Orangeville, and this was a couple of years ago. And one thing I want to note, um, because people tell me this, and I see it myself, is when Lustre pops up, um, it can be fast in one growing season. Like I didn't, I hear things like, "Oh, I didn't notice it," and then all of a sudden, it's everywhere. And I know that when Kevin and I got into this site, we were really quite surprised to see how much loose strike we were there was there. So we were really happy to be doing a couple releases there on that particular day. I think it's noteworthy to mention that in 2013, Excedra San Luis, who was a grad student at University of Ottawa found Nanafee's Memoritus Memoritus in the field when he was out doing field work for his thesis. And as I mentioned before, uh, as far as we knew at the time, and I think it's still the case, there's never been a formal release of Nanafee's Memoritus Memoritus in the province. That may have changed now because there's work being done on Nanafee's in the province. But at the time, it was a new record for Ontario. Um, Except uh, Nana Fees, she had it at 18 sites in eastern Ontario, and she also found that it was being impactful. It was attacking the flower buds, they were falling off the plants, and found that where the uh, where the biogen was common, uh, fruit densities were lower, and that the weevil, the presence of the weevil, appeared to be reducing uh, seed production. She was also curious about niche partitioning. So. Uh, the weevil found uh, in conjunction and on the same plants as uh, she was finding the Alaricella. Um, interesting question for her and also for other researchers at University of Ottawa. So that was a bit of a milestone in this project was finding that that, that uh, flower feeding weevil had naturally moved into the province. Um, another milestone for this project was the um, nation as Cole mentioned earlier, of Ontario's best management practices for purple loosestrife. Uh, one exists for loosestrife, but also for other plant species as well. My, uh, from my experience and from what I'm hearing from others, uh, these tools are, are super helpful um, uh, supporting uh, people who are in the field, managing um, populations of invasive species, looking for funding and trying to get support. So we're grateful um, that uh, this document is available to us today, 2016. 
it's noteworthy to mention, and, and um, I'll talk about this site in particular. This is Riverside Park in Cambridge, Ontario. It's uh, in the floodplain of the Speed River, and um, it's back from the water's edge, actually. It's a low-lying area where water tends to accumulate in the spring. And I did releases here back in the 1990s, and I, I go here every year. <laughs> it, I, it's beautiful. I love it there. Um, I've been watching this site for a long, long time. I watched the beetle populations build. I watched the loosestrife get knocked back. And now, recently, I've also noticed and been watching as the loosestrife is beginning to return to the site, and it happened very quickly. In fact, on the day that I took this photo, I was standing there looking at it, and a gentleman, there's a trail right beside, and the gentleman was riding by on his bicycle, and he said to me, oh, it's a, day, it's a good year for loose strife, <laughs> which I thought was pretty funny because that's exactly what I was looking at. Um, but he noticed it, and it's, of course, because of the flowers, the blooms are so obvious. So I've, I'm calling this the rebound of loose strife at Riverside Park. And um, this is happening in other locations, too. Um, I'll mention the town of Gore Bay on Manitoulin Island because uh, this is one such place where uh, we're starting to get into um, reinducing insects. So um, the richest was done in Gore Bay in the 1990s. Since built, loose drive got not flat, like I'm simplifying this. But that's based what the observation was, and then uh, there was a stability of that, and then at some point uh, the loose strife started to return, um, probably because the uh, beetle populations uh, dropped because the plant populations had dropped. So um, we went, uh, I went back in 2017, and we reintroduced the insects there. So the thing that uh, we're getting into now is the redistribution of the insects, um, uh, selectively finding places where we might need to do additional, re, uh, like additional releases. Um, so, and this was a really fun one. It was organized by uh, Stacia Carr at Town of Gore Bay. She had Manitoulin Streams Improvement Association, Gore Bay Fish and Game Club. She got the local public school out and we had a really fun time. It was an event. And um, and we got beetles out there. There, um, the important element of this sort of the new phase of this project that's in response to how people look at invasive species in general these days is we're really we're, uh, moving towards um, this idea of uh, early detection, rapid response. And um, I've been working with the City of London, and my perspective, uh, their leaders. In this field, uh, City of London um, is the first city in Ontario to adopt a municipal invasive plant management strategy. And basically, what I've been doing is so they work with volunteers, they've got people from the city out in the field reporting to them. Um, it's really uh, quite an incredible thing that Linda McDowell's um, doing within the city. And so, together, we're working, we're systematically uh, going through all the ESAs and uh, finding the loose strife, identifying where we feel that we need to do releases. And uh, we've been working on this over a couple of years and we're getting insects into the ESAs of London, Ontario. I also did some work uh, up on the Bruce Peninsula so to Parks Canada and Nature Conservancy of Canada. I was so impressed. Um, with the individuals that I was working with there. Um, it falls into the early detection rapid response category. Uh, and with this, right, it's, it, I mean, it's the same for anything. Um, if we jump on these things and we get involved and get active in the early stages, um, we can save ourselves a lot of time and a lot of money. So uh, Tyler Miller and Esme Batten, uh, working with these two agencies, and we did a number of uh, releases on the peninsula in fairly remote areas. Um, that's me. The uh, photo reminds me that, that the, being a geologist is the best job in the world because I get to do stuff like this. 
and um, that was kind of a highlight from my summer last year. Uh, it would be interesting to um, look at EDMAP's reports. Colony, and so did Kate from uh, the Invading Species Awareness Program. And Kate, thank you, Kate, for putting together these pie charts for us so that we could take a look at uh, reports of purple history uh, come in over the last six years. So Kate did these pie charts. It shows the top 10 EDMAP's reports reports uh, over a six-year period. So the first slide shows 2012-2013. So in 12, uh, no, basically purple loose strife uh, didn't make the top 10. 2013, 4% uh, of the reports coming in were for purple loose strife. Uh, top slide on the left, 2014. Five reports coming in purple loose strife, and then to the right, uh, didn't make the top ten. 2015, 2016, lower left, three percent of the reports. And 2017, lower right, three uh, percent of the reports. So um, this is a great uh, tracking system that's available um, to all of us to use, and um, people are using it. Um, but uh, low prominence of loose strife in this reporting system. So we don't really know why that is. It might be because there's much loose strife around. And I think that's probably part of it. Um, and it might also be part because uh, loose strife is not really catch capturing the public attention um, compared with maybe some other species uh, like mites. And if you look at these four years, um, you'll see upper left European common reed, 17%. And then right, European common read 11%, jump to 51% in 2016, and then lower right 57% in 2017. And because, um, uh, you know, there's lots of Phragmites and it's in public awareness and people are reporting on it. So this is a great, um, great tool. And it, we're not quite sure how useful this could be over time. I'm is important to be interesting to um, get a sense of public of the public's the informed public's impression on what's happening with purple loose strife uh, in the field. And I thought it would be interesting to develop a survey um, where we could sort of get a snapshot of that. So uh, Colin helped me with this. Uh, we developed an online survey. It's uh, through Facebook. You can access it uh, through the Ontario Invasive Plan. Council Facebook page through the Ontario Fields Facebook page, and I also shared it to the Field Botanists of Ontario group. And you can go on there, and it's a two-question survey, and it's for people who can confidently identify the plant in the field. And it's just um, asking uh, you about your impression on how much loose strife you're seeing in the waterbeds that you, you frequent, and it's. Um, um, it uses uh, conservation authority jurisdictions as uh, geographical uh, outlines. So it, I think what will end up happening, we'd kind of hope perhaps to have some results up for this talk, but it's in a busy time. And I think Colin and I talked about maybe writing something up for the Ontario Invasive Plant Council newsletter. So you might uh, just look for that in the near future and we hope to kind of report on the results of this survey and if you're for conservation authority you'll probably you might get a call from me directly <laughs> um, again the idea is just to kind of get your impression on uh, how much loose strife you're seeing in the field it's noteworthy to men um, that there's quite scientific research Research that's being done on strife, on uh, the biocontrol agents, um, and um, this is, you know, a very expansive part of this program. And I, th I think it's important to uh, note that this work is being done. And I've highlighted a few areas of research. 
Um, most um, there's things that maybe I should have mentioned that I haven't that maybe I'm not aware of, but I'd to group some of them into categories. Um, and I think I'll, I'll share some of this stuff on the Facebook page for Ontario Beetles if you want to, um, you know, follow along over the next little while. There's um, research being done into the efficacy of biocontrol, how effective are control agents um, in control plant. Bog et al. is a particular paper that came out in 2013. Um, being done on uh, changes in purpleustrife, ac actual evolution of purpleustrife is a uh, it's moving towards earlier flowering times in northern climate. Um, and this, uh, uh, there's a good body of botan like botany work being done in this area. That's worth checking out if you're interested. Um, there's work being done at University of Ottawa on the impact that the agents are having on the host plant. Um, and there also, there was a, a, a thesis um, published, like, I haven't looked at the whole thing, um, 2017, Torblanca, Torblanca, uh, actions between the biocontrol agents. So, uh, w and in particular, uh, she's looking at the Neogallaricella and Anapis memoritis memoritis. Um, another paper that came out in 2017 uh, that was interesting to me is uh, showing, show that uh, over the time, over time, uh, the ecology uh, responds to these invasive plants uh, that become uh, new members of of our habitats. So, G moth has been seen on uh, purple loosestrife in Michigan, and um, the ecologists that are doing this work, Seabolt and Landis, and uh, they're finding that um, they're actually they were actually able to rear through gypsy moth, being them purple strife. So um, there's all this work being done in the background. And this, from my perspective, is a really important part of the overall picture of this uh, provincial program. So that takes me to my final slide. Um, I'm grateful for the continued support and involvement of these people and agencies. It speaks back to what I talked about uh, in terms of commitment. Um, so thank you very much. And I guess I will open up to Colin. So Donna, thank you very much. Uh, that was a great overview. I think it's a lot of people that are referring to Purple Loose Strife as kind of the model for biocontrol, like, like you, you mentioned, right? Really successful program important to manage kind of expectations, especially in a more modern context when we're talking about things dog strangling vine and phragmites, biocontrol agents in the pipeline. I guess this is a really helpful kind of model to point people to, especially when we're interacting with kind of um, maybe like introductory level conversations with people about what we're aiming for. So this is this is a perfect overview. Thank you so much. Um, I've noticed, so we've got a few questions coming in in no particular order. Uh, let's go rapid fire if we could. Sure. Um, somebody here is asking for your secret. Where does your beetle supply come from? And can you tell us a little bit about how you go out collecting and 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 see with that? Uh, well, I have a Honda Civic. <laughs> uh, I, you know, um, the beetles come from uh, different places. That's a really big part of what I do is uh, traveling around. I pick, you know, I'm mostly monitoring sites that are close to where I live in Paris, Ontario. I'm traveling between watersheds constantly. I'm really noticing this uh, flux, ebb and flow, a wax and wane of beetle population over time at different locations. I might collect from one site one year and then it dries up. It's not suitable for collecting another year. So that's a big part of the work that I do is staying on top of where I feel I can successfully collect insects from year to year. It changes all the time. Right now I'm down in um, Norfolk County exclusively, but um, yeah, being all the time. Okay. 
Um, so the next question is uh, related to host specificity. So do the beetles have any impacts on native plants? Is there any anecdotal information you might have that are coming across them on native species? Um, uh, so there, I guess there, what comes to mind is like there's two kinds of impact. There's direct impact on native plants. So uh, that may mean non-target seeding by that. That's the terminology there. Are the beetles feeding on anything else? And um, these, so the, these particular biocontrol agents are extremely host specific. Um, there have been incidences of what's referred to, uh, it's a biocontrol bio term, spillover feeding. So there's this kind of uh, scenario where beetles might emerge from the soil and they have nothing to feed on. Like they come out in the spring in May and emerge and there's absolutely no purple stripe for them to feed on. So they're in a uh, eat or die situation. And there's um, a, uh, a few species that were identified in advance as well um, that, um, that the beetles might try nibbling on um, just out of desperation, basically. Um, there's two native species in particular, Lithrum alatum and Decadon verticillatus swamp blue stripe. There's a nib bit of nibbling on those in the field. I've seen it both myself. There have been studies um, where people have tried to have monitored the plants to see if uh, the beetles are actually able to complete a life cycle on those plants, and they can't. So it's a very short-term spillover effect. I have seen a little bit of that in the field, but it's very, very uncommon. And then um, in terms of, let's see, what, what was the question again, Colin? I think it's, are there any kind of spillover impacts on native species? Do you have any observations of Gallarotella beetles on native plants? Oh, okay. So that maybe covers the Gallarotella on native plants. And then the only other impact that I see on na native species is um, positive one. Uh, the, feeding, um, uh, the feeding action of the biocontrol agents on purple loosestrife, um, I from my impression, uh, makes it reduces the invasiveness of purple loosestrife. And then uh, the plant community um, has the ability to respond to that. And um, I see native plant species um, moving into the plant community, they have more of a competitive edge. So that I've seen positive influence of the beetles on native plant species. Okay. So another question here is: Does an ideal release include the release of both uh, species of Neogallerotella beetles, or how determine which is more preferable? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so uh, it's very difficult to uh, distinguish between the two species. It has to be done with the dissecting microscope. Um, so, uh, and also we know that the majority of the insects in the field right now are calmariensis. So the short answer is no, we don't distinguish between the two. We collect Neogallaricella. It's my assumption that most of it is calmariensis. There might be a little bit of Pusilla in there. I can't, I have I've been looking at these insects for so long that sometimes I have a little bit of a gut feeling. I think, oh, that looks like Pusilla to me. There could be some Pusilla in this collection. Um, but for the most part, um, it's my feeling that we're releasing uh, predominantly Calmariensis these days. Someone just came in. Um, do you see this model, Gallaricella purple fitting your class? predator prey models like the snowshoe hare Canada lynx population curve examples? Um, let me, uh, let's see. I might need a little bit more information to be able to comment on, on that. What in particular about those models? I'm wondering if, if they're asking maybe about lag time and how you've kind of alluded to it a few times that that's starting to explain. Um, drops and declines, both in the plant and on the beetle die-off, maybe? Right. I guess we're seeing it as a multi-year lag, right? Like, if we went out there and put some beetles out right now, it, like, measuring that response next year, or...? Okay. Um, I can... I, thanks. Um, 
I can tell you what my feelings are on that and what my observations are on that is that yes, it does, it, it, for the most part, it, um, it takes a while for the beetle populations to build up to a point where they're having an impact on a larger scale. Several years, I usually tell people, um, you know, wait five years. It might be less than that. It might be a little bit more. It depends. Um, uh, but once the beetle populations drop, I, I'm finding, I'm wondering, finding, and this is just maybe gut feeling, intuition, speculation at this point, but it is based on my experience. The um, the bounce back of the purple loosestrife can be quite rapid, can be right, quite rapid, and I think it maybe speaks a bit to the invasive nature of the plant. Um, so bounce back uh, can happen quite quickly, and I. You know, we're trying to get the insects out um, as quickly as we can in these situations to give them uh, the time required to build up in numbers so that they can become impactful. Okay, so we've got another question here talking about like, logistics of it. I'm trying to just by the project here, but is um, I guess, do you have examples? Is it MNR funded some of these projects, or would it be municipally funded or landowner funded? For the services and some of these beetles, um, or can you describe kind of a model project and how it might be funded? Yes, uh, good question. So uh, funding is different for every project. Um, in the past, uh, we've had large grants to do uh, widespread spread leases, but we're not doing that anymore. Most of it's on a case by case example. So um, generally, I would. From an MNR office or a conservation office, perhaps a landowner or a conservation group, and uh, they look for interested in beetles, and and then the discussion starts from there. Um, some agencies are tapping into funding, um, and some agencies are just tapping into their own personal budget. Uh, to pay for the risks, so it really is on a case by case, you know, case, case that we move through that. But I try and support people, and we try and move through that together. Okay. Um, Anna, do you have any examples of releases in areas that are adjacent to provincial parks? Yes, is that a regular thing? Another question came in here. Are there any observations of Gallaricella beetle predation? Are birds or mice acting as big predators? Uh, yeah, I see in the field uh, birds for sure. I see spiders predating on the eggs. I see lots of other insects actually predating on the larvae and on particular on the eggs, not so much on the adults. So again, it's um, you know, the biology, the ecology, the natural environment uh, respond. Anything that's a generalist feeder um, will take advantage of the food that's available to them. Okay, two more questions. If there's any other burning questions out there, make sure you get them into the chat box. Um, so one of the questions here is, what, are the, what is the success rate of overwintering? Why introductions needed year over year? And do you have any thoughts on what impact climate change is going to have into the winter, overwintering conversation? Uh, so, okay, one at a time. Yep. Uh, success rate of overwintering. Um, from my perspective, it's uh, excellent. Um, uh, as, as, a, as a service, as a manager, 
I mean, that's critical to uh, to the program. Once I start working with you, uh, you know, we keep releasing insects until we get establishment. I'm not sure if I've ever had a site where I didn't have establishment. That's why we released so many larvae at one time. Just the sheer number of insects that release, you know, help the insects get through that first year. Um, I've never, never had any problems. So this climate doesn't doesn't like uh, doesn't seem to be a factor. Snow cover is good, um, but lack of snow cover can also be fine. They don't seem to have a trouble getting through uh, our Canadian winters, particularly in southern Ontario. Uh, I have to say that my uh, understanding and familiarity of the more northern sites is less because I don't live on the flip side of the map. So, and I get less reporting um, from groups up in that part of the province. But um, I've never had anyone get back to me and say, oh, we're concerned, or oh, we didn't have establishment of that insect release that we did. So that addresses the first question. Uh, do I have uh, concerns about climate change? Um, there are researchers that are looking at the impacts of climate change on the biology of the plant. Um, yeah, I think it'll be really interesting to see um, what kind of shifts happen over uh, the next little while. Um, there seems to be an evolution of earlier flowering amongst the plants that are growing in the northern region. It's changing uh, time for seed set. Uh, obviously, uh, how much of an impact this is going to have on the beetles, I'm not sure, but maybe some, maybe some. So there was a middle part to that question, too. They were wondering about why introductions are needed year over year. Oh, okay. So um, the, the short answer is they're not. Uh, usually, we, you know, up until this point, we most of the time we're just doing an int one introduction, and the beetles become established. And then uh, they, the populations build with time in response to how much loose strife there is and the waxing and the waning of the loose strife. But we do have some locations where we've had to go in and reintroduce, or we've chosen to go in and reintroduce the insects because um, there may have been a point in the history of the site where the loose strife uh, um, died back because of the, the beetle feeding and then the beetle populations drop back. If there's no loose strife, the beetles die off, and then uh, the loose strife has come back. It's rounded, so we've chosen to go in and reintroduce the beetles. And I suspect that uh, we'll continue doing that over time. Um, don't, it will never be the same as it was at the beginning because it's my feeling that there will be locations where uh, beetle populations are just going to start building again on our own accord because there's an increase in amount of food for them. The last question is native plant recolonization after successful biocontrol. Uh, so is there seed application needed or do you have a strong native plant bounce back after achieved successful control? Um, that's a really good question. And I encourage people to, uh, I think that that, an, that can only be answered on a site-by-site -site basis. Um, I think if there's, uh, um, it depends on what's in the seed bank and it depends on what's already there, already growing there. And my advice to managers is, is that if, if there's an other invasive species that might be ready to move in, you want to watch that. And um, if you want to specifically uh, care for your site more closely, uh, you can go with seed mixes or maybe introduce native plants that you'd like to see come back there. It would be a good time to do that. So um, there is a level of attention uh, that might be recommended after after the release, if you're concerned or um, interested in how how that plant community um, succeeds over time. Okay. Okay. Thanks very much. I think we've got them all.
Uh, if there's any other burning questions, I bet people can always reach out on your Facebook group, uh, the Ontario Beatles Facebook group, or even on your website, right? OntarioBeatles.ca. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. okay, well, Donna, thanks so much for uh, presenting today's webinar. Great kind of historical perspective on a really established her kind of case study um, in Ontario invasive plants. And just a quick pitch for our next webinar. Our webinar series continues on March 21st. We've got Michael McTavish, PhD candidate at University of Waterloo. Mike's going to be presenting on the interactions of earthworms with invasive plant restoration considerations. So certainly a really interesting kind of neat topic out there, and uh, I think it's going to be really well received. A quick pitch for that. You can find out more details on that and the recorded version of today's webinar at ontarioinvasiveplants.ca slash webinars. So, Don, thank you so much for your time today. Really appreciate it, and uh, we'll look forward to talking to you again soon.